So we've got a great panel here um, led by Jonathan Victor of Protocol Labs. And we've also got uh, Vanessa Grillet of Aglay Ventures. We have Jesse Damiani of Post Reality Labs. And um, we have Jeff Bandman, who amongst many other hats that he wears, is a key member of the uh, 6529 project. Um, so with that, I would like to turn things over to Jonathan Victor. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> very bright. <laughs> Everybody, uh, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. My name is Jonathan Victor. I work at Protocol Labs. I do a lot of our BD work for NFTs, gaming, helping educate people about IPFS and Filecoin and how to think about storing their assets on decentralized storage. I'm super excited to have the lovely people over here on my right uh, here to talk with us today about resilience for NFTs. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd love to first maybe go down the line if folks, maybe Jeff, if you want to start, and then Vanessa, and then Jesse, uh, maybe you could introduce yourselves, and also a little bit about your projects and your teams, and yeah, what you guys are working on. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to uh, see the Filecoin community. Yeah, so I'm uh, Jeff Bandman. Um, over the course of my career, I've been a, a lawyer, turned business executive, turned financial regulator and then have spent you know, most of the last you know, six or seven years focused in the digital asset world. Um, I currently uh, work with uh, Punk6529. Uh, are people familiar with NFTs or Punk6529? I can explain. That is, got a show of hands maybe. Okay, great, a few. So anyway, so my, my colleague who is uh, pseudonymous is uh, one of the world's top uh, collectors, thought leaders, uh, you know, in influencers uh, with regards to NFTs and is very passionate uh, really about how NFTs are a very critical path of the transition layer, getting from where we are in more of a Web 2 environment to a Web 3 environment where um, NFTs will be an important part of an open metaverse where, you know, you can have an ownership society where people actually own their digital objects as opposed to having them under a license as you would on a, you know, Kindle or Apple or Amazon uh, type, type thing. Uh, and so uh, within the 6529 group, uh, we recently launched an alpha version of an open metaverse, which we call OM and hope to have many communities there. Uh, we have an NFT uh, museum and actually there's a 6529 museum district uh, in the uh, open metaverse, but you can also just go see it on your phone or your browser on OpenSea. Uh, we have an NFT asset management business uh, we also, you know, do kind of education and so on, and, you know, I do a mix of op operational, legal, regulatory, compliance things, and we're, you know, very passionate, and obviously uh, Filecoin and the distributed uh, file storage is a very core part of both our philosophy as well as the practical part of how we own and use the uh, technology. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Grillet. I'm the general partner at Aglae Ventures. Um, I started my career in financial services for almost 15 years, working for the New York Stock Exchange. And then I've been in the digital asset world for about eight years. I was an early employee at Consensus, where I worked there for five years, um, and very early in NFTs. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, then I worked for uh, an investment firm called CoinFund, who was also very early in NFTs, and we created a specific structure called Metaversal that invests in NFTs, like Punk 6 by 2 9 and, um, and then, uh, more recently, um, I became a general partner at Aglai Ventures, which is a fund that uh, focuses on Web3, early stage uh, investments, and that is backed by the LVMH family. Um, so a lot of connectivity here um, with brands and, and other projects in the space. But um, I had the chance of being very early in NFTs and talking about NFTs when no one cared. Uh, actually, when CryptoKitties came out um, at Consensus, everyone stopped working. We were just trading CryptoKitties, so it was really funny um, to see the evolution from there. And really excited to speak about storage today and security around NFTs, which is a growing concern for a lot of uh, the actors in the space. Hey everyone, my name is Jesse Damiani. I'm a curator, writer, uh, and advisor in new media art and emerging technologies. Um, I'm a little bit of the like sort of odd bird on on the panel. Um, my background is in poetry. I actually have an MFA in poetry, so uh, I've I've had a sort of um, labyrinthine route to to uh, you know emerging technologies and, and blockchain. 
Um, as it is sort of germane to our discussion here, I um, curated Impermanence, uh, which is the three artist show that's playing around you, so please talk to me about that. The artists are incredible, and I'm really excited to share about their work. Um, and I curated Proof of Art, which was the first museum retrospective on the history of NFTs. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, maybe to kick it off, I would love maybe, uh, I'll, I'll throw this to maybe to you, Jeff, first. I would love to hear if maybe you could talk, you touched about this in your intro, sort of how you see the role of decentralized storage. And I think one of the things at least I've observed is in the NFT space, we have a massive entrance of new folks who are coming in. I think people coming from all sorts of backgrounds, as Jesse mentioned, we're having an influx of artists. So I'm curious if maybe you could frame uh, sort of like for NFTs, why decentralized storage may be important and sort of the role that you see it playing and how it sort of relates. Sure. So uh, no, I think that's a great, great place to start the conversation. So, you know, really, um, I think to, to take a step back, um, you know, what, what are NFTs? And then I think, you know, philosophically as technologically, why is this uh, a very important structure for, for them? So as I was alluding to in, you know, my initial, uh, you know, just in, introduction, you know, in the, in the Web2 world, um, you know, where things are centralized, they are highly convenient. And, you know, lots of businesses, people have started thinking, well, people will ideologically value, you know, privacy or self-sovereignty, but, you know, the average person does things because they're con convenient. So to move from sort of a, a Web2 society, which is highly centralized, and is not an ownership society, but is a kind of a licensed society. You know, if you have an audio book and you stop your subscription, you lose it. If you have a thing here, you're playing a game or something, and then you move to another game, you can't take your objects with you. So in a, you know, to move to a kind of a Web3 decentralized but self-sovereign world, you need to have kind of your digital objects, whether it's digital information. Um, and, you know, we sort of started with distributed information. When people think of file storage, people thought of information. But, you know, really, um, you know, I think the big and exciting thing, and, you know, this is part of the, you know, core innovation, I'd say, of, of Bitcoin, uh, of, of the blockchain, is, you know, provable, unique, you know, kind of unique ownership, uh, provable on the blockchain that can move at the speed of the Internet. And so for that promise to be truly realized, um, you know, there needs to be a decentralized, censorship-resistant mechanism that lies behind it. And so when people think about NFTs, they probably think about where we are in sort of the current layer of NFTs, and sort of the first types have been, you know, art, collectible objects, you know, kind of crypto kitties or similarly digital, digital objects. Um, but, you know, ultimately, NFTs, you know, we believe will be all sorts of tokens, digital rights with kinds of utility, not just kind of art and, and gaming where, where it started. Uh, so, you know, having a resilient infrastructure that is not linked to a particular service, service provider, you know, centralized mechanism that's, that's decentralized like email is very important. And so, you know, part of the value of the NFTs and, and the art, you know, which is where 6529 focuses uh, in the 6529 Museum, is, you know, that these are censorship resistant you know, things that exist everywhere in the world. And that infrastructure is absolutely critical to moving on to the next phase of a digital ownership society. Yeah, it's such an important point. And I think it kind of highlights a thing that sometimes you don't really think about, especially with like IPFS, Filecoin, they both use this thing called content addressing, where the reference is not to any specific service, it's not to any specific provider, it's not even to a specific like storage layer specifically, it's just, hey, this is a property of your data and so that data, whether it's coming off of your computer, my computer, a thousand different storage networks, it's always going to just be that fingerprint of the data, which gives you all this interoperability, but also like an upgradable component. Um, maybe to kick this to you, Vanessa, as like someone who's running a VC fund, as you, and this is maybe a little bit speculation on where NFTs go, that interoperability story becomes much more interesting perhaps when we start thinking about cross-chain NFTs. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the resiliency story when we start thinking about NFTs that maybe move across ecosystems or anything in that nature. Yeah, cross-chain NFTs is a difficult topic at this stage. Um, you know, the bridges uh, infrastructure is not all um, catering to uh, NFTs right now. They're focusing more on, on assets and tokens and data. 
Um, so we haven't seen any successful um, examples of uh, bridging that works really well with, with NFTs, and I think that's something that's coming down the, the line. But I think you know, we're, we're still at the stage of you know, when VCs invest, of centralized you know, models like OpenSea um, and gateways to um, sort of the consumers uh, to access NFTs. And in that, in that perspective, uh, which gives you access to more immediate monetization, um, there's less of a long-term uh, vision for permanent storage, for sustainable models that will help you know, NFT succeeds in the long term. So we're looking at like quick business models that allows everyone to have access with some risks on the security side, with some risk on um, just the, the infrastructure side, let alone the storage. And then I think the next phase of the evolution will be to see um, these NFTs being really truly interoperable, but right now the technology is not there. Yeah. Well, I, I would also love to hear maybe, Jesse, from you, as we think about sort of like the types of use cases, so cross-chain NFTs is one, but maybe more from the artist perspective, too, for the different types of things that people want to build, I think one of the reasons sometimes we see people move away from decentralized storage into like centralized storage is to enable something they think they can't accomplish. I'm curious if you have any perspectives on the different types of NFTs that people are trying to build and where you think maybe there's areas for opportunity where, yeah, what are use cases that are underserved by the technologies that we're building here? And how can we actually build both like resilient systems that could support those use cases? And yeah, maybe like what are the things that as an open challenges for people to work on? Yeah, I guess to answer that, I'd, I'd build on Jeff's point that, well, this isn't just, what, what comes to mind is that sometimes the most innovative things and the most profound things are actually the simplest and when we look at the potential for you know, authoritarian regimes to, in a, in a single moment, wipe an entire piece of sort of um, cultural history off the map, be that through you know, physical violence or, or through any, any other means, getting artists to start to think about their work as potentially objects of historical importance in their approach is really, really important, and it's really, really simple. But I think when you can start to position the language around what they're doing is like, this is less about thinking about what's the easiest and closest at hand for you right now, and more about, we're now thinking about long-term for your career and your trajectory as an artist, but also what that potentially means about the environment that you operate in and the sort of time-stamping aspect of your work as being part of a moment looking back 500 years in the future. So like one artist um, who I work with and is a friend of mine, um, his name is Aaron Huey, and he's actually come to not just NFTs, but um, emerging technologies in general. Um, he has kind of a, a storied career as a Nat Geo photographer, and in the course of trying to, st to tell certain stories was unable to do so in a way that he felt like he could do it justice. So he kind of got into photogrammetry and started to figure out how do you preserve um, objects of historical relevance in three dimensions and then how do you ensure that where those are stored are safe. So it's kind of been this uh, growth process to get to this point of realizing, oh, the decentralized storage solution is the only way that I can, or the, the best way that I can achieve both my artistic goal and also my sense of history that I'm trying to preserve and also potentially, you know, hand off into to future generations. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. I actually don't know if they're here today. Uh, some buddies of ours, the FAIR.XYZ team, they helped Ukraine do their NFT sale uh, to like help fund the war effort. And like literally, like buying those NFTs is like a political statement, uh, which is like crazy to think about that this is like, if you think of like even the arc of NFTs, if we go all the way back to like CryptoKitties or whatever, that's like not that, that's five years. <laughs> like, and we've gone from there to like actually something that, yeah, kind of more momentous there. Yeah, can I just, just comment on that? Yeah, it's tremendous. So we have, in addition to the 6529 Museum, we have an asset management business, 6529 NFT Fund. So, so we actually bought you know, two pieces um, that were in, in response to uh, that. There was a really phenomenal uh, ex-copy who's a tremendous one-of-one -one artist and sort of, you know, his work is really glitchy. Like, we, we believe he's going to be sort of the Basquiat or 
he already is the Basquiat or Herring of sort of this generation, but it's a really dramatic one of sort of the, you know, women and children in front of the, the tanks. And then there was a, another uh, a Dmitry Cherniak ringer that was sort of blue, you know, had kind of the blue and yellow uh, colors. And, uh, you know, it sort of looks like a soccer goalie in a way. But, you know, it, was, it you know, happened to have exactly the Ukrainian color. So it's, you know, really exciting. And it's sort of like, you know, if you had the opportunity to buy, you know, Guernica in, you know, 1939, you know, it's that sort of, you know, these, these artists can really respond to the moment. And I think, you know, the NFT artists, you know, people are really finding their unique voice with a lot of authenticity in this um, environment. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, maybe this is both uh, a question for you, Jeff, and you, Vanessa. Uh, one of the things that I find super fascinating from the 6259 side, obviously there's a lot of education that your team sort of puts out helping like both people think about just why NFTs are generally important as like a response to sort of like the privatization of so many other parts of the web. Uh, I think more interestingly, what we're seeing now also with web two companies realizing that NFTs are a way of like engaging with different folks. I think we are seeing sort of like an inflection point where as we have, again, these new entrants who may not value the same principles that this community does value, how do we both educate like the broader population about like the importance of the primitives that these things are built on? And then also making sure that as new entrants are coming in, they aren't like diluting, not necessarily be like, well, how do we make sure that they aren't sort of like setting a new standard where it's like it's, will, it's worth it to compromise on these different solutions? Um, I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that front. So do, going to me first, yeah, it's a really, you know, really fascinating question. So maybe I'll talk about it at a kind of a personal level and then more, more broadly. So, you know, I have to say it took me some time for, uh, you know, the light bulbs to, to go off and kind of connect a bunch of dots about, you know, like why are NFTs important? Why is it not just a bunch of stupid JPEGs? And then, you know, also, what does this have to do with, you know, you know, deeply held feelings, you know, I've sort of had, and I think many people have had, you know, about all the things that are wrong with Web 2 as opposed to, 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 to Web 1. And, and it's interesting, when I just take one further step back, you know, when I sort of teach uh, students, as I have about, um, about kind of blockchain and talk about what originally animated Satoshi and, and the white, and obviously we won't totally know, right, because the person's pseudonymous, but, you know, it was distrust of, you know, uh, central banks, governments, um, you know, large banks, you know, they were sort of the targets, those were the intermediaries that the white paper seemed, you know, focused on. But, you know, somebody who's missing from that, you know, from the white paper, that, that is sort of big tech. You know, maybe it's implicit in that, because that's another intermediary. But, you know, like, I think the level of anger at big tech, there was maybe in 2008, 2009, there was a little more trust. I think that what animates a lot of people in, this, in these communities is that. So, so for me, just sort of seeing, oh, wait a second, you know, kind of NFTs are actually about not just kind of collecting crypto kitties or beautiful generative work, but it's like self-sovereignty of our own digital objects. And, you know, that is going to be the bridge to the get to the, to the next level where it's an ownership, you know. So I think it took me a while to, to kind of connect those things. I think, you know, it's going to take a lot of education. We have to, like, tell our friends, you know, uh, 6529 writes these long tweets and like, uh, you know, something we're kind of a mission driven organization and something that we all share as a concern that, that, you know, right now over the next 12, 18, 24 months is when the battles are going to be fought up about what, you know, kind of Web3 is going to look like. And, you know, we've launched a version of the metaverse. It's, you know, open. We're trying to bring as many communities as, as possible. We're helping people you know, build things there. You know, there will be many metaverses. Metaverse, you know, the way we think about it is not just going to be like Second Life or a game, but it'll be the way we experience the world, you know, digitally, you know, whether it's through headsets or glasses or just through, through enhanced things. And, you know, as a society, we're not really having a conversation about it. Um, we're just sort of letting it happen. You know, policymakers talk about what, what I think are just kind of pointless things fighting the last battle where you know, like an Elizabeth Warren will say, well, you know what, we should break up Facebook into Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook. But, you know, if you just break up the Web2 companies, but, you know, they're just doing the same thing and you're not promoting, you know, a Web3 world where people have ownership and governance, you know, you're just going to get a replication of it. So, you know, I think that education is critical. Um, I think we're 
Um, you know, I think all of us need to do it as much as we can. You know, 6529 writes long tweet storms. We're trying to, you know, educate people that way. We'll, we'll be doing uh, more of that. But, you know, I think it's also okay and natural that, you know, brands will come in, that there's NFTs are also about excitement and community. You know, of course, brands will come in there the same way that, you know, banks and bricks and mortar companies adopted uh, the internet. And so, you know, I think we need to make Web3 convenient and accessible for people if that's actually going to be the model that prevails. I think in order to drive mass adoption, we really need to keep the principles of decentralization really as um, sort of the North Star. Um, brands and more centralized entities will come in to um, you know, build on the hype and, and get the, oppor the immediate opportunity to um, give the consumers access to NFTs. But the long-term vision is that the digital will lead the physical, right? Where we'll be in the world in a couple of years where the value of your digital life will be worth more than your physical life. And NFTs enable that because it enables true ownership in the digital world, which was not, and provable ownership in the digital world, which was not, which was not possible before. And so we, we need to see from that perspective the revolution that it brings. And like um, what Jeff was saying, this is not just about JPEGs and art and, and uh, collectibles. It's going to be about any asset that we can own in the digital world. So looking at that um, for the long-term vision, I think we should all direct our efforts in you know, trying to explain that and trying to get people involved as soon as possible so that they can also be part of that revolution. I'd love to also jump in um, and, and add that I think that oftentimes the contributions of artists in this framework are, are treated more around the lines of like, oh, art and collectibles are how NFTs came, came to the fore. And, and to, in a sense, that's true. But I also think that there's this missed opportunity where like artists are the ones that kind of go in and provoke and perturb and sort of surface the questions that aren't being asked. And they're simultaneously the translators to broader audiences. So when we're talking about education, finding ways to really support artists in beyond like simply buying NFTs, which is great and shout out to every NFT collector for supporting an artist. Um, but finding ways to engage their subject matter expertise, which is weird and doesn't always sort of fit cleanly inside of sort of an existing shape. But when we're looking, when we're looking to education, oftentimes artists are going to be the, the best translators to make these subjects not only understandable to public audiences, but interesting. Well, actually, that leads into my question that I was going to ask for you, which is I'm curious if you have any thoughts or recommendations, both for artists and creators in general, uh, both on like the tooling front, like if they want to like make use of this stuff, what, what do you use? What would you recommend for folks who are trying to create in this space and actually take advantage of decentralized storage? And then also from an education perspective, are there any resources that you found or wish existed that would be yeah, uh, useful for other artists who are looking to learn more? I think in a sense, a lot of the resources already exist, um, both from a, like, a practical standpoint of like explainers and, and documentation and things like that. I think that culture moves often uh, at, at a, different aspects of culture progress at different speeds. And so we had this sort of surge of interest in, in 2020, 2021, and now 2022. But there's a lot of people that are still catching up. And so there's, there's oftentimes a big gulf between um, very easy, accessible documentation and, and that having made its way to artists through the networks of artists. So a lot of these questions come down to social questions more than, than tooling questions, where it's like, if you can get the right existing information into the hands of somebody who doesn't currently know how to find it, then you've, it's sort of a, a win across the board. Um, so related to that, I do wish I saw more, like there's this hackathon structure and culture in the dev world that you don't see as much in the arts world, but it's in part because art works almost antithetically to code, where instead of exactly trying to solve a problem, it's people coming in with 
provocations and ideas, and they're going to say things that sound stupid at first, but then when you sit with it, you're like, oh, that's actually really profound. I never thought about that. So thinking about social structures where that space can be made and where the cross-pollination with, with the devs can, can occur and, and the respective subject matter expertises can collide with each other, that to me is the, is the thing. Because in terms of resources, I, I, I honestly think they're already there. It's more the interpersonal, like, you know, AFK people frameworks that I, that I would like to see more of. That's super fascinating. Um, yeah, actually, I'm curious, uh, maybe the same question on the collector side as well. I think one of the things that we've seen is a lot of folks, actually, my Uber driver yesterday was talking about how he was looking at NFTs. Uh, and so someone who's very new to crypto, I'm curious, as you are both experienced collectors, how would you recommend people better educate themselves? Are there also things that maybe even you employ as practices to like better protect your NFTs? I don't know if you run your own IPFS nodes as well. Like, how do you guys think about that? And yeah, are there any things that you would recommend for folks who are looking at NFTs from the buying side? Me or yeah, both actually, yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, a couple of things. For, first of all, I think sometimes people feel it's too late. You know, gee, like, it's already happened. I'm too late to the end. It's still so, so early with, with NFTs. So first of all, just, you know, for people who only know a little, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's very early. You know, if you look at the metrics, you know, I think it's like Bitcoin 2012 or 2013. You know, for all the hype, there's a million active wallets on OpenSea. You know, there's, you know, single digit millions on, let's say, Coinbase's, you know, waiting list. Obviously, there's, you know, fewer users of, of, other, of other platforms. So, I mean, first of all, take the pressure off yourself. Um, secondly, you know, I think that although there's a lot of FUD and nonsense and people pumping and stuff on crypto Twitter, there's also, you know, a lot of very valuable information, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things about Twitter is you can follow people and see who they follow. So, you know, there are some people who are very thoughtful about um, NFTs, you know, I think so follow them on crypto Twitter. Obviously, Punk6529 is, 6529 is good to follow. Uh, Von Mies is thoughtful. Um, you know, Batsub Yam and Bharat, who are other two other members, a couple members of our team, are good. But just just follow them and you know, kind of see what's going on. But I think cynically, because there are a lot of people who are sort of pumping their bags there, and so you know, don't think you know a lot of people are doing that. Uh, but I think you know, follow people and see who they follow. Secondly, you know, experiment, but don't you know, you know, buy, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, NFTs that you can buy for, you know, under 0.1 ETH. Um, you know, a lot of it is denominated in ETH. Also, there's people working in Tezos and Solana and other, other protocols. Uh, you know, at 6529, we're more focused on the, the ETH denominated ones. But, you know, just have the experience, you know, buy one, send one to a friend, you know, have the experience of dabbling. Um, you know, there's uh, 6529 actually has a long tweet on how to safeguard your NFTs, depending how complex and valuable, you know, how to use them, get them from MetaMask to a hardware wallet to, you know, Gnosis smart contracts, depending on that, you know, but just like dabble and experiment, experiment with it. But I, I really think the important thing is to say, you know, it's not too late. It's still super, super early. And, you know, I think that People often just, they have this thing in their head that said, I've missed it. It's, it's just getting going. And, you know, if in fact we're about to enter into a, a long bear cycle, you know, maybe we are, maybe we're not. Obviously, people keep, keep building. But, you know, this is probably a good opportunity just to dabble in it hands-on and, and learn it yourself. Awesome. Well, maybe with that, uh, I don't know if the audience has any questions. We have a couple minutes, so maybe we can open it up. Um, yeah, if you have questions, I think there's a mic that's floating around. So if you just raise your hand, they can come grab you. Can I actually chime in here? So just as this panel was happening, Mark Benioff tweeted announcing that Salesforce is launching a new uh, NFT cloud service, essentially, uh, which is kind of ironic just given what we're talking about here. So um, I guess I would like some maybe some thoughts on how does this, these worlds of centralized versus decentralized NFT storage platforms maybe collide here in the future? So I think it's, uh, it's a question of convenience uh, to drive adoption, right? So when you have a company like Salesforce or another really large company that has 
that client power and that offers a service that's convenient, it's going to be much easier to drive adoption, right? And I think that's a great first step uh, because you can't expect everyone to just be a decentralization maxi and, and know everything about decentralized storage and how to use MetaMask and, and custody your, your assets. So I'm still enthused by this type of uh, initiative because we see you know, these large Web2 companies really coming in and understanding the opportunity, even though they still have centralized um, sort of uh, vision. Uh, but I think you know, it's the evolution of the web. They will, we will start like that, and then they will need to go towards more decentralized models in order to uh, thrive. Also, wasn't the Salesforce hack like last year? Like, wasn't there a massive Salesforce hack in 2021? Maybe it's 2020. But it's just sort of like a funny, it's a funny thing to think about of, imagine, imagine if Salesforce were an individual person who had had a hack of the scale that they had, then the next year coming out and making an offering about, about storage. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think, you know, to kind of, to Vanessa and Jesse's point, you know, right, so these, these companies have a track record, but I think that this, you know, illustrates, um, you know, that, that, you know, once, you know, NFTs are a new asset class, um, in fact, it's multiple asset classes, you know, we're just sort of at the beginning, let's say art, collectibles, but, you know, a, you know NFTs are going to have so many different uh, use cases, um, you know, hotel rooms, right, I think are a, a class that, you know, will be a future uh, you know, type of NFT, right? Like you want to go on vacation somewhere. There's like 30 different databases, uh, you know, that are each separate uh, in Austin for people who booked rooms here earlier or later. What if those were all on a single database that were, you know, an open limit order book and, you know, somebody who booked a room early, could, you know, so that there's, there's lots, you know, so many possibilities. So when you think about NFTs, you know, don't limit your thinking to the NFTs we see today. Think of like all the NFTs we'll see in the future. And, you know, going back to Vanessa's point, I mean, I agree very strongly that, you know, of course, as these things rise and become more important, of course, the Web2 companies, uh, the ones we know or new kind of companies that would adopt a Web2 business model will come in. And, you know, as much as, you know, assume that most of the people who are at, uh, you know, a Filecoin conference are very pro-decentralization, but, you know, I think most people in the world, they just want to have a service and a thing that they can use and it's convenient. And the decentralized community is going to have to work that much harder because people, you know, there's a small group of people who will prefer to use decentralized solutions. And, you know, God bless, because I think that's what's getting all this stuff started. And there's an even smaller group that's so ideologically and excited about it that will actually work to build. That's great. That's what, you know we're here for and that's critical. But, you know, we can't underestimate the competition. You know, Web 2, you know, the empire strikes back and it's powerful and it's got more resources and they've got a lot to lose. And they're not just sort of going to give away those business models, which are highly valuable business models where they have governance, they have economics, they have control, they have stickiness. You can't leave and take your things with you. Of course, no one's going to give that away. Yeah, it's funny. Uh to respond to, I guess, Aaron's thing as well. I always like to talk about like Web3 is being the ability to exit. Like that's how you can tell if it's a Web3 system versus a Web2 system, where if you can leave or like you can switch to another provider and do that without disrupting anything else, then you know that it's like at least somewhat decentralized. And I think like even for Salesforce, the ability for them to like, to Vanessa's point, I'm optimistic that like it now is bringing a wider aperture of folks in. I think the more important question, though, is are they making NFTs that like require you now to forever maintain a Salesforce server because you've pointed it at like some specific location on their thing? Or is it something where, like, yeah, if a user wants in the future to like migrate off, again, it's just a content hash. It doesn't really matter if it's stored on a Salesforce server or on some server off of a Filecoin miner or whoever. It like lives somewhere is the point. Um, I think that's the things that like we as a community have the ability to hopefully influence. We're just like making it explicitly obvious that like if you aren't doing things in a decentralized way, you're inherently baking in fragility, uh, both for the end user as well as for Salesforce. Now Salesforce has a 
I mean, depending on what they're offering to their customers, they're now require, creating an obligation for themselves as well where they can't leave that business model like even if they want to in the future. Uh, and so I think it actually, this is where decentralization can both be like a pro for both sides where it gives Salesforce more optionality, it gives customers op more optionality, and hopefully it leads to like more positive sum interactions. But I think this is where like education is the main thing that we can push is like a general set of people. So everyone after this, tweet at Mark Benioff uh, and let him know. Um, cool. Uh, any other questions that are floating out there? Or maybe we can uh, wrap up. Cool. Um, great. Well then, thanks everybody. Yeah, and thank you all for joining me today.